you can get a lot of information um, about them online and um, stuff like that. And so I really want to like make the most of this time where we're actually talking about them in person and try to give you information that you maybe like haven't gotten when you looked it up online or feedback that you didn't get. So I wanted to start off just by quickly talking about um, what disciplines you're in, because obviously like there's a lot of similarity. This is abstract, abstract writing. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Sorry about that. that my it, yeah. They're instructed to tell everyone to come over here. So. Well, they locked the door, so I guess they got stuck. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so basically, I want to know, yeah, what discipline folks are in, because there are some differences and some similarities, but it could help me sort of know as I'm talking, like, is everyone a scientist? Do we have social scientists, humanities people? Um, what's the kind of, like, uh, percentages of everyone that we've got in here and then also do you have questions or have you had challenges or is there like a specific reason why you're here because you struggled with something with an abstract or were asked to write a kind of abstract you didn't know anything about or um or something like that it's okay if you don't have any specific questions or challenges but I'd love to know about them ahead of time so that if I have information on them already I can like incorporate that into what I'm talking about and if I haven't thought about that question before maybe I can think about it a little bit um so yeah while we're figuring out this slideshow maybe you guys could start thinking about that question and also sharing some of your disciplines and um and questions and people on zoom can do that either by unmuting yourselves or just by putting those things in the chat um if you want to unmute yourselves maybe we'll start with people in the room and then i'll say okay if anyone on zoom wants to like say theirs out loud um or you can just stick them in the chat whenever you're ready I'm gonna get this. I have no idea if they heard that, but I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> they, should. Um, they should be able to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. I think that's okay, cool. Um, yeah. So do you want to start just going around our circle? I know uh, you just got here. We can start on that side if you like okay. unless you're already okay. ready. Okay. I'm Milo. I work in the anthropology and pathology department. I'm a technician, so I've never actually written a academic paper. I just do the field work, but this is some this is a skill I'd like to have for the future. Cool. My name is Pallavi and I'm a postdoc in the Department of Biological Sciences. I have written a few of abstracts, but what, uh, if I share, I think that is like starting writing is the most toughest part. Once you started writing, you just get yeah. in the face. Yeah, so like finding structures to get yourself started. Okay, yeah, and like we said in the um, explanation for this, yeah, sorry it is a little slow for folks, in, or sorry, slow, small for, for you guys in the room. So again, if you have trouble seeing, you can come down here. Um, but uh, yeah, part of, part of what this is is also going to be like techniques you can use for outlining any kind of... Um, scholarly writing, so yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Irma. I, I'm a postdoc in uh, Family and Consumer Sciences. Um, I also have some experience writing scientific papers, but um, what is difficult for me is sometimes uh, fitting the limit of um, characters for the abstract. Mm. And yeah, yeah like um, to know how much is too much for each of the sections that that's challenging yeah that makes sense um so like the right amount of detail mm -hmm. okay so my name is Lorena Jimenez I'm a postdoc student in agriculture science and I had been writing some of paper and research but I want to improve my competence it's like like her is that the idea to resume all your stuff in in that work that work so yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to talk a lot about that because that is generally one of the biggest challenges um, with abstracts is like getting enough context that people can understand, but not so much detail that they can't understand because they don't have the context for it. So kind of going to be the subject of a lot of what we talk about. 
Yeah, um, I'm Leah. I'm an undergrad, but I work as a research assistant in these guys' lab. Oh, nice. But I'm working on a paper in neuroendocrinology right now, and I'm just not really sure where to start. So that's that's why I'm here. Cool. Uh, I'm Rohan. I, I'm a PhD student in the human factors department. Uh, I've worked on some like lab projects, but haven't really written anything yet. So um, I just here to learn how to start writing. Yes. Think about starting yeah. to write. Okay, cool. Yeah, and abstracts are a funny thing because they're like an overview of the entire paper in some ways. Some people start with them. We'll talk about this a little. Some people write them first and then rewrite them at the end uh, once they've like written their whole paper to kind of know and know exactly where they're planning to go. Um, and I know that people sometimes have really opposite takes. Some scholars are like, write them first always and then write your paper from there. And other people are like, don't even try to write them till you're done because you don't know where it's gonna go. Um, so we can talk a little bit about like the pros and cons of that stuff too, um, but yeah. Um, hey, I'm Marina. Um, I am in the Water Resources grad program. I'm a new master's student, so this is just information for me as I've been instructed, you know, to write some of my semester papers and then there's my thesis based off of a publication format. So cool. just starting to learn early, trying to. That sounds good. Um, okay, cool. If anyone wants to talk on the Zoom, you can go ahead and jump in. We have some people putting things in the chat. Um, if anyone else wants to add questions, um, we have cross-disciplinary. You guys can't see the chat, which is the one bummer about this Zoom setup. Um, but I'll read out some of the questions we have in the chat in case there are questions you guys also have. Um, oh, question about writing abstracts that are speaking between slash across fields. That's a really interesting question. and. Uh, one I think I'd have to think a lot more about because I haven't written too many of those, but I think that we are talking about like the differences between abstracts across fields. So maybe we can think about some of the ways those could be melded together. Um, nutritional sciences, someone who's just new to writing them. Um, more general writing technique questions, um, smooth narratives in papers in general. That's also, yeah, really interesting. I think we will definitely talk about the way that an abstract is like a mini narrative of your whole paper. So um, yeah, if anyone else has any uh, questions they wanna jump into the chat with. Um, someone has a question. You mentioned that some people write abstracts in the beginning and rewrite at the end. Do the people who write in the beginning write in their outline stage. Yes, I think that that's sort of what some people advise is they're like the abstract can almost be like a condensed outline of your paper. Um, it's a, it differs from an outline and we'll talk about this because it's not, uh, it's better to have it sort of give you uh, much more of the answer to that question. Like, why should I be interested in this? So what? basically then an outline, which is gonna be like, first we'll talk about this, then we'll talk about this, then we'll talk about this. Um, but it does mirror the outline of the paper in miniature. So in that way it can help you be like, this is gonna be the narrative of my paper. So to get that smooth narrative. Um, yeah, so we'll go ahead and start the slideshow. I know we advertised this. Um, we had some people enjoy doing some like in-class uh, sorry, this isn't a class, but like in workshop writing last semester. So we're gonna do a little bit more of that today, I think. Um, and then like discussing what, uh, what happened with that. Um, I think that we'll, but we're gonna start off with just like kind of a little bit of a like slideshow talking about what abstracts are. Um, so I think if people have questions at any point throughout that, either in the room or on Zoom, go ahead and jump in and ask your question. Um, and we can diverge, especially if one of the slides brings up a question that you have, we can spend some time talking about that. Um, I definitely want it to be like less of just like, I talk and talk and talk and more of conversation, hopefully if people have questions or insights. Um, so our 
Now I have to figure out how to make the slides go forward. Please hit the arrow as it should. It should go. It's actually, not. Is a, really? Isabel, could yeah. you could you introduce yourself real quick, just so everybody oh. knows, like who you are, what you do, a little bit. I know we. Yes, started of course. <laughs> Sorry, we started unconventionally, so I got confused. Dude, that's my class. <laughs> I never, I never remember to introduce myself. On yeah. <laughs> um. So that this slide is just about the questions we already answered. So I, yeah, my name is Isabel Marlins and I am the graduate writing consultant. So I work at the writing center and for COGS to um, basically work with uh, graduate writers and postdoc writers and faculty writers on their scholarly writing. Um, and some of you have come there before, but if you haven't, yeah, we work together at every stage of the writing process so we can talk about doing research. We can talk about taking notes. We can talk about outlining. We can talk about writing an abstract and spend a whole hour reading an abstract really, really carefully and fixing every single punctuation mark and analyzing the every word choice. Um, or I can read through 20 pages of your paper and we can talk about how the overall narrative of your thesis is working. Um, so basically I'm just there to be a reader who kind of knows like a little bit more than the average person about scholarly writing um, and who can give you feedback, talk to you as you're working on your piece. Um, and we'll have some links for where you can make appointments for that and stuff at the end of the session. Um, yeah, so is that, does anyone have any other questions about who I am? Does that seem like a pretty good <laughs> introduction? Pretty good. Okay. Pretty good introduction. Um, <laughs> so um, basically the purpose of an abstract is to provide an overview of your topic that you're gonna research. I don't know, for those of you who are kind of new and just jumping into it, um, I, I used the word summarize here, but that's not, it has to both summarize and interpret for the reader the most important points in your paper. Um, and I say like the, for those of you who haven't even written them yet, if you're just learning about the form of the scholarly paper, they usually always come at the very beginning and someone can read them as they're kind of like a trailer for your paper, um, like a movie trailer for your paper. Um, and a lot of times you, if your paper is published online, the paper itself is behind a paywall. So all that readers can see is your abstract and that's going to help them decide if they want to buy your paper or order it. Um, and other times if you submit a paper for publication, it's the first thing that the reviewers will read and they're going to maybe decide. I think people usually say if they have your whole paper, they're not going to like completely rule you out because your abstract is bad, but it's really going to help you if it's good. And then sometimes when you're applying for conferences and other things, you just submit an abstract. So it's really all the reviewers have to see what your presentation is going to be about um, or what the paper you're going to present is, is going to be about. So it can be really important that it is well written, that it capture your work and convey what's important about your work. And also, yeah, that it's just written to catch a reader's attention. So it's kind of like the part of your writing that's like the least about the actual science in some ways and the most about like writing or science research, social science research, humanities research, whatever it is. And the most about like engaging an audience's attention, um, which doesn't mean it can like why about your work or be persuasive in ways that aren't just like tied to the work itself, but it is really like oriented towards an audience, if that makes sense. Um, and then it should emphasize the originality and the significance of your work, especially <laughs> because, yeah, if anyone's going to publish your work or have you speak at a conference, things like originality and like the importance that. So what question, why should I care about your work are really important for those people to know. Um, also, it should like use the language that you use throughout your paper. So keywords are really important in abstracts. Like it can help your audience know what it's gonna be about, but also if it is published ultimately, like this is thinking far down the line, but for postdocs and stuff, it's very relevant. It's, and PhDs, of course, it, um, yeah, it helps search engines find your work. So making sure you use the most important language that's in your work and your abstract. Is, is a good idea. Um, 
okay, I have to click this. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk, there are different kinds of abstracts. This is again, just a, a really big overview of the different kind. Informative abstracts are definitely the most common. That's like what probably most people have seen when they're searching for a paper online. There are other kinds, there are structured abstracts, which are usually used, I think, in like clinical, like for medical. You had to do one, didn't you? Yeah, yeah they're like basically very similar, but they just actually have a part that tells you exactly what you're gonna read in each sentence. Um, descriptive abstracts are very similar, but without the conclusions, uh, like the results and the next steps usually, and they're usually used in the humanities and they're much shorter. So we're not gonna go into too much detail on those things because really they don't come up super often. But of course, if you have to write one, you could come and meet with me. I think a lot of the writing principles that we're gonna talk about apply to those types too. And I guess I'm gonna say over and over again today, like when you're writing abstracts, one of the most important tips is checking what the place you're going to submit it to wants from an abstract because there are some differences and every once in a while they'll have some random specification. And if you don't do what they said, they'll just say, no, nope, this one's bad. <laughs> um, so that's always something to check. Um, as like a general rule, informative abstracts are five to seven sentences, um, like approximately 150 to 250 words. Um, but sometimes they can be longer, like especially like humanities conferences, they often have longer abstracts because you want to provide some like literature review and information about the scholarly conversation you're joining. Um, so sometimes they can be longer. Uh, but the general rule of 150 to 250 words, that's like a very standard length for abstracts. I don't know if anyone's encountered something really different, feel free to say so or put it in the chat. Um, and then, yeah, generally they should include like these five basic parts, the background or the stakes that so what of your study, um, the question or the purpose of your study. So in your, uh, in scientific or social science research, the research question um, in, in humanities uh, abstract, like your, your question and your thesis or your argument basically. Um, there's a really big, is it like a dissertation defense or no, something? It's, uh, brown bag, which I think oh, okay. Yeah. Like, big <laughs> applause. Um, <laughs> methods, uh, results, and then your conclusion and the significance and the next steps of your work. Um, so, gonna head. Okay. So, for the purposes of this talk, I, um, sorry, I'm trying to move my, zoom thing around because I can't see what time it is. Okay. Um, I, oh, let's see. Can you guys see, can you guys see the words? Mostly. Yeah, this yeah. is too bad. Oh, well, you can just drag up. So where's the, are, are you talking about how the, the, yeah, the, the picture is there. The picture. Why is that there? You mean, oh, you mean the video of us? Yes, the video of us. You can is just, there you, a way to you, move you, that? Yeah, you can just click on it and drag it. Um, the well, problem is it's not, it's not, it. it's not on my screen. Yeah, I oh. can't see it. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's funny. I think that it does have to be descriptive. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I will just read it and try to make it so like you guys can see it. Yeah, exactly. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Can you, can um, you okay. something on the little, um, thing on the table, like, uh, the controller for the room that says like display video yeah. or not. Yeah, maybe. There might yeah, be a so. thing you can select that makes it go away. It's a good idea. Because we can't see it on Zoom, which is good, but yeah. <laughs> I'm scared I'm gonna like accidentally end the Zoom set. <laughs> yeah. Because it wow. like there's there's there is this there's an option that says turn off. Okay. That well, might be that. But... You could just leave it and I'll just move it while we have yeah. to read things that are under it. So Basically, uh, what I did here, just to sort of think a little more about this, and I want to say quickly, for people who are more at the stage of just thinking about what a scholarly writing, piece of scholarly writing looks like, 
the structure of the abstract is just like the structure of the whole paper or the whole thesis or the whole dissertation. So everything we're talking about with this structure is basically just the whole structure in miniature condensed. Um, and if you have questions about that or how that could possibly be, um, just let me know. But it is really similar to the introduction, the literature review, all those things mirrors a sentence essentially in an abstract. Um, so I just took a paper that I found online, um, a fairly recent paper, and I, I chose one that's like um, kind of cross-disciplinary that involved uh, people doing climate change research and people doing psychology research, because I was like, maybe people in different disciplines will find this interesting. But it basically does everything that sort of a standard abstract should do. And also has some things that I might be like, oh, maybe I would do this differently or we could think about suggestions for a different way to do it. Um, but basically their first sentence is doing a ton of work. Um, and I will say right off the bat, like usually short sentences are good in abstracts. And one of the things that sometimes people do that's a problem is that they've been told an abstract should be five sentences. So instead of making it, six or seven very clear sentences, they make it um, five huge, really hard to understand <laughs> sentences. So generally don't do that. But a sentence like this is actually doing a lot of work. It's pretty long and it's also pretty easy to understand. So they started off by saying, despite a consensus about humanity's responsibility for climate change, many people fail to behave in line with their pro-environmental attitudes. And the question of how to overcome this environmental attitude behavior gap remains a puzzle. So they're basically telling us right away that this paper's stakes are climate change, which is a really easy one. A lot of people have that as their first sentence. But a lot of people forget to put it in because they're like, well, nobody really cares. Like I, they know it's about climate change on some level, but it's really about like soil microbial communities. And that's what's more important about it. Um, but the reality is that again, for your abstract where someone's reading this, this is all they're seeing or the first thing they're seeing, they really want to know this. So what, why should I care about those communities? And the biggest answer is because we need carbon sinks and soil, right? Or something like that. I'm just using that as a random example. And so for you as the researcher, it's always in your head that climate change is the reason you're doing it. But actually for someone who's just reading about your work for the first time, they may not really know that. And so having that right there in the first sentence is really helpful for them and immediately tells them, oh, this is why this work is important. I'm not saying everyone's has to be climate change, but that is a pretty <laughs> common one that comes up with it. Um, with all kinds of scholarly work. So then they're telling us also in this first sentence, they're immediately telling us there's a problem. Many people fail to behave in line with their pro-environmental attitudes and the question, and then they're telling us about a question of how to overcome this environmental attitude behavior gap remains a puzzle. So we can assume that's the question they're probably gonna be exploring in some way. So yeah, so this first sentence is doing um, a lot, all this work you don't always have to get that into one sentence, but the first few sentences should be doing all of that work in your abstract. Um, just like in a, in the paper, your introduction will do a lot, most all of that work as well um, in a thesis dissertation or research paper. Um, so then in sentences two to three, what they do here is they say, so this is one thing that I thought was funny about this paper. They say, to address this lacuna, I, lacuna, I don't even really know how to pronounce that word. The present research provides further insights into motivational, dispositional, and structural factors underlying pro-environmental behavior. So they're basically expanding on their question expanding on where there's a problem or gap in the current scholarship. So that's a really important thing that you do with your literature review, the next chapter or section in something. And that's what they're doing here in the second sentence. They do use this word, <laughs> lacuna. Like, I literally had to look up how to pronounce it and then I forgot because okay. it's one of those words that I vaguely know the meaning of, which is literally just gap, gap that needs to be filled. It's exactly what they mean. But generally, 
when you're writing an abstract, it's advisable to use simpler language than that. I think they didn't use gap because they used gap at the end of the previous sentence. And so they probably Googled synonyms for gap <laughs> because they wanted to use a different word. And I think in the past they did use that word more often for research, but it's really fallen out of, uh, oh, wow, I'm going forward. I want to go back. Um, yeah, the common usage. So that's a good point too. Like um, when you're t turning these in, especially to like conferences, I feel like to think about who is going to be reading it, like mm -hmm. envisioning that person, because you know maybe not with that particular word, but like just in, like with jargon in general, like simplifying words, because they might be in your field, but they not might not be in like the specific like region of, yeah. of your field though. So like always using simple language is like that's I don't know, I've, I've always been told that's to like err yes. instead of caution with that. A little bit. Definitely. Yeah, simpler language is usually better. And I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm doing research on something and I'm reading abstracts, Googling topics and reading abstracts for papers, and I come on one with a lot of really complicated language that I can't understand, I'm way more likely to try to look for a different paper on the same topic because I'm going to think like, I can't make any sense of this, even though I know something about this topic, I'm yeah. not gonna be able to understand this paper. <laughs> Unless it's like, I mean, I guess you can kind of read the room a little bit based on like where, you know, maybe if it's like a very highly spe like specific journal or right. a highly specific conference, then like maybe totally. you can get away with more of it. Like if they're using like your, if it's like a conference about like the model you use for your research, then maybe you can get away with that a little bit more. Yes. If it's like a really large conference, they probably just have like a hodgepodge of reviewers looking over, you know, a lot of these abstracts. So it's like maybe just read the room a little bit too on like where you're submitting it. Just having yeah. that awareness would be. I, I don't know, just yeah, no, I'm totally right. We're, we're going to talk about that too, because that's another piece of advice people give is like kind of like in a cover letter, adopt the exact language of the job posting if you've done those things. Don't lie or plagiarize, of course, but come as close. If you, they look for the keywords they put in the job posting in your cover letter. Um, I, I know people advise to do that with conferences. If the conference has a theme, try to use the language and, and, your, and your work is a similar topic, but you weren't using that exact language. See if you can adopt the exact language that they're using a little bit and use it in your work. Um, I think that's like, I don't know, probably more common in the social sciences and humanities because people come up with uh, terminology for something that isn't universal. I think in science, it's kind of like, it's either about this or it's not about this. Um, but yeah, I know I'll, every, when I was bringing that up with other folks at the Writing Center, they kept bringing up that they recently did a... Um, they recently did like a, a themed writing center conference, writing conference where the theme was the multiverse. And so it just led to all of these terrible abstracts and conference and like presentation titles that all had to do with superheroes and stuff. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's like now everyone has to have that on their CV forever. Um, okay, so yeah, so the next, sentence um and uh is gonna be the third to fourth sentence usually gonna be basically like a mini methods so they say based on a decision task with actual environmental consequences we show that pro-environmental attitudes are more predictive of pro-environmental behavior when personal costs are low or environmental benefits are high so the first clause in the sentence is a mini methods it tells us they used a decision task with actual environmental consequences but they don't really tell us about much detail and then the second clause of the sentence is results they're already showing us what they found from that experiment so they're really getting through it quite quickly but I, you do feel like you have an idea okay that's what kind of experiment this was this is what kind of results they found and in a humanities uh, abstracts, it would be really similar, just like using this theory and these texts, I explored this question in this way, basically. So um, then the, in this case, they, um, the next sentence expands on those, um, highlights those important results and explains their significance. 
So importantly, self-control helps people to act in line with their attitudes, suggesting that self-control is a crucial trait for protecting people's long-term pro-environmental goals. Um, so what I liked about this sentence is they do use that transition word importantly, and they literally tell us this is the important result. So this is what we're really going to discuss and what you're probably going to get out of reading this paper is a better understanding of this, or this is the thing we think here has the biggest implications. So it's like a teensy teensy writing thing to use that one word importantly, but it actually really helps their paper because if they just use that sentence without it, it would kind of be like, why are they just telling us this thing next? Is it, what's the relationship of it to the other things or to the paper as a whole? So we'll talk a little more after this about those transition words. Um, and then their last sentence proposes implications and next steps. So we propose that mitigation strategies should take into account the motivational, dispositional and structural complexity associated with pro-environmental decisions. Um, so again, they use that transition phrase, we propose that to tell us this is exactly what came out of our paper. This is the significance, the so what, this is why you should care about reading our paper because we're gonna tell you this thing that is actually gonna help with climate change mitigation strategies. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, that's the, the abstract I broke down. And honestly, most good abstracts, you should be able to break down in a really similar way. And if you're thinking about writing your own abstract, um, kind of like I have an outline for one at the end of this slideshow that basically you could just start by trying to fill in each one of those things in one or two sentences each. I kind of like allowed for you to take one or two for at least a couple of, to hit at least a couple of those points. Um, oh, sorry, I kept forgetting to move it down for you guys to see it, but um, I'll do that for these ones. So this just does a bit of a recap of the things we talked about with those, um, those strategies and techniques. And again, for those of you who did workshops last semester, you'll see that a lot of these are really similar to the general sentence construction techniques we talked about for all kinds of scholarly writing. Um, but yeah, choosing simple and familiar words. In this case, I was suggesting you choose the word gap. Um, but I think that you're right, Michael, that like just really trying, I, I say this, the next slide just emphasizes it a ton, but thinking about, because again, this is a really outward facing piece of writing. It's really like audience facing piece of writing. So thinking about what your audience is going to understand. Um, I wonder too, so like, you know, what's like hard with like the threading the needle with like repeating words. Yes. It's like, it's actually not that bad. Sometimes it's, it's fine to repeat words if you're referring back to the gap, right? Yes. Like, it's like, maybe it would be confusing if it's like, gap and then suddenly it's lacuna yeah you know what I mean because we're like well we're talking about like a different right like it's like actually you probably could in that instance just keep using the term gap yeah right? right I mean yeah I mean it, that one's a little funny because I think they're technically talking about different gaps I guess no it is the yeah. same one because they say this lacuna it's so it is the same one you're absolutely yeah. right so it, the whole gap is like the difficulty of solving it's like a little bit it's the difficulty of solving the gap but yeah that's mm -hmm. the gap Yes, and that's something I talk about with people a ton. Mm -hmm. Repeating is better than people being confused. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've talked about that so many times, but sometimes people think that like it's more, yeah, it's more boring to be repetitive, but it's more boring to be confusing actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, because <laughs> I like that. Yeah, then it's a good way to look at it. I like that. Yeah, I mean, I know when I'm confused and lost in a scientific or difficult scholarly paper in any discipline, that's when I stop reading because um, it is gen genuinely like hard to keep being interested in something you can't understand. Um, yeah, so short, simple sentences, generally address one topic per sentence is what a lot of the guidelines say, as you saw with that one we just looked at. A lot of those sentences do actually have more than one topic in them and are quite clear, and I didn't find any of them hard to understand. So as long as your sentences are easy to follow and you can see the connection between the two topics in the sentence, I think that's fine. But if you're getting starting to get confused, um, 
or lost, then that's when you should make your sentences shorter and try to stick. If your sentence is getting really confusing, think about whether it's just because you're trying to say too many things in one sentence. Um, and then, yeah, I have that I, the signal phrases guiding the reader through the abstract. These are really universally advised. Like just say to answer this question, tell people exactly what, uh, where the question is. Tell them exactly what you found. Our results show we found that. And then again, significantly importantly, tell them what's important. Um, these results suggest they can be used to do this. We propose that you do this. So those kinds of phrases, short but sweet, can do a lot of work. Um, and then, yeah, going to like the level of detail question that we were talking about before. If you have really impressive numbers in there or something like that, if you made some really impressive discovery or finding, if you're in history and you found something that had never been found before or something, make sure that you talk about that because originality and showing that you have the like actual, uh, numbers and data and artifacts to back up what you're saying is really important. But at the same time, um, a lot of numbers that, again, the reader doesn't have the context to interpret generally make it worse. So finding, trying to hit that right balance. And I think that all comes down to whether or not a reader can interpret what you're giving them. Um, and then the, yeah, highlighting those big picture stakes. So we need to do this to slow climate change. This has applications for food security, those kinds of things. Again, people can tend to think like, that's so basic. It seems like I shouldn't have to mention it or it's so clear to me that that's what this is for. I shouldn't have to mention it. But remembering that your audience may not automatically be, unless you're, again, submitting to a conference where every single thing is about, uh, I don't know. But even then, even if it's a conference about potatoes and food security, you still want to make it clear that your piece is about potatoes and food security. So I think it's still good to emphasize. Um, if it is like a humanities abstract, that might involve more talking about the stakes of the scholarly conversation you're joining, like people arguing that different narrative forms are more or less effective for this or that, like talk about how you're going to be joining in that conversation. Um, or it could be something else, um, but just making the case in history that your thesis or the argument you're making is important for some reason. Um, answering that, so what question, which a thesis itself should answer. Um, and then, yeah, highlighting originality and innovation. We talked about that a little bit. Um, and then really uh, simple, getting down to it, verb tense. Some people have questions about this. I don't know if anyone does, but I figured I'd include it because it's like a basic. Um, yeah, it's just like an APA style paper. Uh, things that remain true should be in the present tense. Things that you did in the past should be in the past tense. Um, and things that might happen in the future. This could have implications for this, da da da, will be in the future tense. Um, and then just hitting again, if you're submitting to a conference or a journal or something like that with a specific theme, <coughs> write to that, uh, read the specifications and requirements of each place you submit before you submit. Um, and this is like basically the flip side of all those things I just talked about. So avoiding unnecessary details and data that people don't have the context to interpret, avoiding jargon like we just talked about, non-standard abbreviations. <laughs> people also sometimes use those in their abstracts. Good to avoid those because people don't have the context for them. So you can use a standard one that everyone knows like USA, but not something specific to your field. Um, and then this one I gave this last semester too, but it comes up a lot in abstracts, the noun clusters, because people are trying to make things shorter to fit a word limit or to fit a sentence limit they end up making their sentences more confusing. So they give this example in this book um, where someone writes cultured rat tracheal endothelial cells, uh, which is like really hard to understand that cluster. Yeah, like the rat itself is the exactly, it a cultured rat. rat. <laughs> yeah. Sense. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense. And, and it doesn't. Cells from the rat that is very cultured. <laughs> <laughs> yes like what is his name this chef rat yeah 
um, cultures of endothelial cells from the tracheas of rats is longer but less confusing. So if you can cut words elsewhere, it's good to try to make sure that those things are less confusing. And in the same uh, vein, we talked about this last semester in the workshop as well, but another one that people do commonly do in abstracts is separate the subject and verb a lot so that they can pack a ton of information into clauses in the middle of a sentence. And I will say again, this is really applicable to all scholarly writing, but it's commonly something people do when they're trying to write something shorter or fit a word limit is they look to make sense of a sentence. Um, people just do look to make sense of a sentence through the relationship between the subject and the verb. Um, and in some cases, we only know what the subject of a sentence is by asking who or what does the action in this sentence. So if they're far apart, it can start to like make a sentence really hard to follow. So they have these examples in a paper on doing clear scientific writing where it's a this is a an example of a science paper obviously but this is the kind of paper that people tend to do this in where they decide they're going to stuff a ton of detail into the middle of a sentence especially in an abstract again because they want to get it all in there um so in this case like the um the subject of the sentence is the smallest of the ERFs or the URFs. I don't even know how to say that. Um, and then the verb is has been identified. So basically that's the smallest of them has been identified uh, are the things that have to come together, that have to be close to each other for that sentence to make sense. And in the first version, all of those words in red, 23 words, are separating those two parts of the sentence. Um, and that makes it really, really hard to follow. Um, and that a lot of that detail, the authors of the paper who, who used this example, they decided that a lot of that detail in red wasn't actually necessary to understand what was going on in that sentence. And so they cut much of that detail in the second version of the sentence with the blue, they, um, they kept uh, some of the numbers and they said, you'd have to ask this researcher whether those numbers are important for the meaning of the sentence or not. And then they made a third version that's all in black where the everything that they thought could possibly be cut was cut. But when you're, when you're doing an abstract, it is worth thinking that like, as I'm putting in details, as I'm putting in numbers, as I'm putting in explanation, if it's not, um, if, it's a, if it's a humanities abstract, what of, what of this information is necessary for the reader to understand those big questions like the so what, what's important about this? What, um, what do, how do I like understand the overall narrative of this person's work and, uh, what of this detail, and of course, what of this detail or data is really impressive <laughs> and would draw people to want to read or use this paper, and what of it could be cut because it's actually just interfering with people's ability to understand the so what, to understand the context and the story of the paper or the abstract. Um, yeah, does, does anyone have questions about that? Does that sort of make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I rushed it a little more than I did last time, but um, I don't want to bore people who already saw these slides. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, okay. So we talked about this being a little bit of an interactive workshop. It sounds like some people have abstracts or work they might already be working on. Other people might not, or just be more at the like starting out phase. Um, so something that I had um, in mind, was basically like, if people want, I think what we're gonna do, the plan currently is to take, we have about, we the beginning did go a little longer than we thought. So I think we're gonna cut one of our original plans, but we're gonna go ahead and just spend a few minutes. Do people have either a notebook or a computer that they could like work on some of their work? Okay, spend a few minutes, um, basically, uh, 
thinking about your own research or your own work or something that you're working on and just kind of like seeing how many of these sentences you can fill out or if you already have an abstract you've been working on, working on um, revising it if you feel like there's any are any ways that it doesn't meet the structure. Um, so that I was hoping we would have enough time to do a little bit of a like pair share where people could talk to each other about what they came up with. Do people feel like that would be helpful or do you feel like we have too many people here who are kind of like at earlier different stages of writing for that to really be helpful? Probably the latter. Yeah. But if we, if we were to devote a whole workshop session to that, it would probably be fine. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it might be a little bit, it's just, it's really hard to plan these also when we have the Zoom and the people and just, it becomes a little bit hard to have it be too interactive. Um, but why don't we just do a thing where we spend um, like maybe six minutes looking at this outline and thinking of your work in the context of that. And then um, ending by, hopefully we can have a little bit of group discussion whether anything comes up or any new or additional questions come up from that. And then um, I can just give you this, we'll give you these slides and you can take your abstract or whatever you come up with whenever you do come up with it to someone and ask them these questions, ask them to read it and ask them these questions if you want to, because I think it could be really helpful. And it's, it's generally just like, this is the whole idea of this exercise was to get people to um, basically like think about it as like an audience facing piece of writing and get it good out there and get people to give them feedback on it. Um, so yeah, do you guys, is that, is that good with everyone? We'll spend like five to six minutes just thinking about your work in the context of this outline and then we'll do a little more discussion of that. Okay. <laughs> uh, if Sasha, uh oh, okay. Sasha is still here. I would love if you wanted to unmute Sasha and ask another question about interdisciplinary abstracts and whether anything came up from that conversation or um, how any thoughts about how like different disciplines might be brought together and combined in an abs in a single abstract. Um, all, yeah, Sasha's so. probably approaching it because I know <clears throat> Sasha, you work with the Confluence Lab, right? I think that's. Probably where Sasha's yes. coming at from, yeah. 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 Um, well, I think actually just the the emphasis that this is really audience focused is helpful because there's probably even with interdisciplinary work, yes, talking to multiple fields or from multiple fields, but there's often a primary audience depending on mm -hmm. where the fact is going and so I think just that reminder is helpful in terms of thinking about what needs to go in the abstract what is catching attention and what gets explained right yeah that makes a lot of sense so thinking about if you're go applying to a conference that has an arts focus versus one that has a, yeah, a natural resources focus or something like that. Mm -hmm. And maybe shaping the same information a little bit differently or some, yeah, um, that makes a lot of sense. I would also really like emphasize, like, I feel like part of what, you know, I'm just thinking of like natural resources and like humanity studies, like a lot of what they're trying to do by merging those, especially in the context of the Confluence Lab is like addressing the short, the shortfalls, like the pitfalls of like one particular mm -hmm. discipline. It's like exactly. there's certain things that like the humanities can't accomplish all on their own. There's certain things that like science can't accomplish all on its own, right? And so yeah. it's like emphasizing that like whatever the discipline you're bringing in in that specific context is like complementing and adding to. I don't know. I just, yeah. I wish there was there was like a more I had like a more like nuanced. No, way I to think say you're that, absolutely but. right. The so what or the reason you should care. Sorry, we're talking through this whole time, but <laughs> uh, the the reason, and I'm gonna address the keyword question very shortly too. Um, but the reason that you the so what of your work is the cross disciplinary aspect of it. So it it is literally saying like there's been the gap is that we have been too siloed 
in the disciplines. And so what I'm doing is trying to address that gap by bringing together work that's, uh, yeah, speaking in different languages or whatever it is. And so I think that that making that essentially the so what or the big picture stakes we're addressing climate change in the Northwest through bringing together work in different disciplines. Um, that's like, the, in that case, the methods is a big part of what makes the thing original. And that's the case in all kinds of fields. Sometimes the only thing that's original about your work is that you found a new method for synthesizing a metal or whatever it is. Of, uh, like, and it's less expensive and more sustainable than previous ones. So that's the whole thing you want to emphasize. Um, and that's kind of the case with, with that kind of work in a certain sense. So yeah, emphasizing what's being done by bringing together different fields or disciplines. Um, and yeah, as far as the keyword, um, what are the roles of keywords and abstracts? Well, yeah, the relationship between them is a couple different ones. Um, the reason I always mention using keywords, like we talked about, using the same word for things throughout your paper is really helpful because sometimes people will switch up the language and they'll use a different name. Sometimes they'll use the Latin name of their species and sometimes they'll use its common name or something like that, thinking like, this will make it more interesting because I'm using different words for the same thing. People come to me with that all the time saying they switched the words they were using for the same thing because they were worried about it being boring. It's such a common thing I talk about with people in the writing center. Most of the time, it's better to use the same word for something throughout your whole paper because like Michael was saying earlier, it's easier to follow that way. And yeah, it's better that, that not to be confused. So that's one role of keywords is coming up with those keywords that you'll sew throughout your whole paper to help people follow the meaning of it. The other use of keywords, like literally from the computer algorithm perspective, which I understand much less, but is also important for abstracts, is that you want people searching for your topic to be able to find your paper or searching for papers on your topic to be able to find your paper. So if you can think of words that are really central to that whole field of research and that you think a lot of people are going to search for. So if you're writing about some kind of insect and plant interaction or something. And really what the big picture stakes of your paper are is that it's about like pest management, like use the, for food crops, like use some of those words that someone who's just looking for sustainable pest management for food crops papers is gonna find your paper. Does that make sense? So use the most common language that you think someone would use if they were searching for papers on the topic of your paper. Does that sort of answer the question uh, about keywords? <laughs> There's, yeah, sort of two parts to it. Um, okay, does anyone in the room, I'm, again, we talked your whole writing time, but did any thoughts or is there any questions that came up from doing the writing either, yeah, in the room or on Zoom? We only have a few minutes left, but. Or hopefully maybe you just wrote a whole abstract. <laughs> oh. I'll say just um, thinking about good the pro tips too to leave folks with. I think you mentioned it a little bit. I was thinking that actually while we were here, I just got notification that I got accepted to a conference I wrote a proposal Yay. or an abstract for. Yeah. And I was thinking about what I did when I wrote it. And I literally just, they had like several sort of, um, this is what we're looking for statements written out. And I literally just copied and pasted those into a Word document. Yeah. And then I, I, I wrote them separately and then I, and then I pieced every piece I, I pieced it together after doing that but I did that to make sure I hit every like to be super specific if they have like prompts too like you'll run into that quite a bit yeah you know, that was my approach in that one it seems to have worked I think so. that's really good oh yeah. I see at least you have your hand up you can definitely jump in yeah thank you um I have a question about Part of the paper being one of the one of the topics of my paper is to advocate for the use of different language than is commonly used in the mm -hmm. literature. Yeah. And so my question for the abstract 
is should I pivot to that argument? It's it's a secondary argument of the overarching paper. It's not the primary, but I use the terminology um, after the introduction, after we introduce why we're advocating for the change of language. Mm -hmm. And I have some consternation about using that phrase in my abstract. Um, any thoughts on that? Oh, that's actually tricky. I think, mm -hmm. um, so you're thinking like, so it's like a secondary, it's a, it's secondary to your sort of central question or purpose. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That would be a tough one because it feels like you'd almost have to mention it as a second thing. Um, unless you think of a, I feel like, honestly, that's one I might have to like see to process exactly <laughs> what you mean, if that makes sense. But I guess just generally thinking about that thing is how, how important is the use of the new language to that? So what question is it really like essential to that uh, central reason why someone would want to read your paper? In which case I would try to find a way to work it in probably as a second sentence, a secondary concern of this paper is developing new language to address these issues because there's a gap and we're lacking language for this. Um, and see if you could bring it in as a secondary kind of central topic. And if you can't do that, or you think it's not that important, like potentially leave it out and have it be explored in the paper if that makes sense. But if it's a really big part of the paper, I would just try to find a way to incorporate it. But I would say bring it in and we can talk about it in much more detail if you want. <laughs> Super. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I, does that sort of help at all? Does that make any sense? Yeah, it, it, it helps me understand <laughs> that it's something to really deeply consider. And there's a reason it's difficult to decide whether to do it or not to do it. So you yeah. affirmed my my conundrum, <laughs> uh, which is Basically, great. Basically, I've told you, yes, it's hard. I don't know what you should do. No, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, I think I would really consider how central it is to what you want people to understand the paper to be about. Um, so we are hitting two o'clock and I think there's people outside who are waiting um, but <laughs> we'll share the, I'm going to share this PowerPoint with everyone and yeah, definitely feel free to use the outline, feel free to ask people these questions, show them your abstract and definitely feel free to come to the writing center and talk about your individual abstract questions with me or one of the other writing consultants. So thank you so much for coming. Could, uh, could everybody, could everybody write their name down on this piece of paper when they leave? I try to keep track of who comes.